Welcome to this week's edition of Good Books Radio. Audiobooks.com is the chief underwriter for Good Books Radio, which is produced by UTRGV Media Services for Rio Grande Valley Public Radio. And now, here's your host, Dr. John Cook. Welcome once again to another edition of the Good Books Radio. I'm your host, Dr. John Cook, and with me today is Leonard Malodinow. His previous books include bestsellers Subliminal, which is the winner of the P. E. O. Wilson Literary Science Writing Award, The Drunkard's Walk, a New York Times notable book, War of the World Views with Deepak Chopra, The Grand Design with Stephen Hawking, as well as Upright Thinkers, Feynman's Rainbow, and Euclid's Window. He also wrote for the television series MacGyver and Star Trek The Next Generation. I'm in awe of your resume. Leonard, welcome to the program. Thanks, John. This book, Elastic, Unlocking Your Brain's Ability to Embrace Change, has a lot of interesting notions in it about how the brain works and the science behind that. One of the things that you note very early in the book is the rapid pace of uh, uh, knowledge, of acquisition of new knowledge. That we double our knowledge every nine years now. I didn't, I didn't know it was that big a deal. Oh, definitely. In, in the science field, and I'm a theoretical physicist, it, it's gotten so bad that it's, it's uh, very difficult to keep up with what's going, being done in your field, although it's possible. And then in, in allied fields, you really can't know everything that's being done. And then outside of that, even within the same, uh, say, field of physics, but areas of physics that are not closely related to yours, you really can't. There's about 5,000 new journals being uh, created every year just to handle all this overflow of knowledge. And it's, it's not just in science. In industry, it's the same way. Uh, you know, companies and technology are figuring things out, and all this is leading to a lot of competition, a lot of innovation, invention, and uh, forces that are challenging existing companies and existing ways of doing things. And the offshoot of that is a, is, is a bit of a turmoil where, you know, you have your blockbusters go out of business, your your um, Encyclopedia Britannica, Sears, all over stores are failing, the, the half-life of a of a Fortune 500 business is now 20 years. It used to be 60. And in your personal life, you're constantly having to deal with change, with you know new technologies, new apps. Even software upgrades can be annoying. You have to figure them out and, and deal with them. You have people trying to steal your your account information or your identity, or you know take over your computer and ransom you. Uh, ask for ransom. Uh, there's it, it making a you know. You know, making a uh, getting a taxi now, you have to use an app. You used to just call a number, right? I mean, it's it, it's more convenient, but you have to learn how to do it. Um, if you're making a vacation, you go online, and now you're going to websites from different airlines, and the fares are constantly changing. Uh, you know, every people might not realize it, but everywhere you turn in life, life is getting more fast-paced and more complex. And what that calls for really is a new kind of thinking in which, uh, which in which you adapt and you accept change, and you learn how to quickly reformulate uh, the way you look at things and uh, in order to optimize your response. Yeah. You know, you, you, you described my frustration as an older guy who's somewhat technically challenged with all the new technologies that uh, our, 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 our younger generations uh, adapt to like, uh, like nobody else. I mean, they're always on their uh, iPhones they, or their iWatches or whatever, and I, I just... I can't get my password right to get into PayPal sometimes. Um, but there's, uh, that's part of this whole notion of, of uh, some of us are change averse. But there's a myth that everybody's resistant to change. And I know I used to teach that when I taught managing change. Uh-huh. Um, but hey, it, <laughs> it's really not know, John, the yeah. case. Yeah. That's right. Well, when I was started writing this book, I ran into that issue, uh, and as I'm reading all the neuroscience and psychology literature on change, I'm reading about how humans have a quality called neophilia, which is the love of the new, how we're so well adapted to be able to accept and respond to change, and how that ability is one of the things that allowed our species to survive, one of the main qualities we have. It's not our strength or our speed or the sharpness of our teeth, our ferocity. It's our social interactions and our ability to innovate is what allowed us to survive uh, all the uh, horrible uh, you know, issues that were presented to us in the last hundreds of thousands of years. And then I read in the business and finance literature, people are change averse. How do we get change? How do we overcome their change averseness? Well, if you look at it, it wasn't hard to figure out what the conflict was. So the neuroscientists and the uh, psychologists have a point. 
uh, and they know what they're talking about. The people in the business world, they, they, have a, they have a very skewed view because the change they're talking about is generally negative change. It's your boss telling you they're cutting your hours or giving you more work for the same salary or there's going to be some layoffs or you have to learn a whole new way of doing things where you were comfortable with the old way and now you have to put in extra time over time to figure out how to cope with the new way or whatever it is. Uh, they're, and they're trying to become more efficient and, you know, they're trying to increase their bottom line at your expense. And so you are averse to that. But if your boss came to you and said, Leonard, hey, we're trying to make the company less efficient. How about if you work uh, 10 hours less a week for the same pay? Who would oppose that change, right? They're always talking right. about negative change or change that involves risk for the individual as opposed to positive change. But the truth is that for change in general, if it's neutral, uh, you know, if you can separate out the implications of the change, people love change. They don't want to be bored. They don't want to have a rote, repetitive job or life. And that's just the way we are as a species. And so we have these ability to think, a certain ability to think that other species don't have, or they have to a very small extent. So you can put thinking on a spectrum. And at one end is logical, analytical thought, where you follow the rules of reasoning from A to B to C. So you have the problem set up for you within a certain framework, and you know what your goals are, and you reason from your assumptions through to your conclusion. And that's what computers do, and that's what most animals are programmed to do. So if, if the environment or the challenge or the issue is something you've seen before and things aren't changing, then you just take that framework, you apply logic, and you figure out what to do. But if you're in a new situation, one that you haven't experienced before, that doesn't work because you first, before you can apply the logic, you have to understand how to interpret the situation, how to formulate your goals, how to create a framework um, to understand the situation and a plan and a uh, mode of attack. And that's the kind of thinking that's at the other end of the thought spectrum. That's elastic thinking. It's about letting go of comfortable ideas and conventional mindsets and looking at things, new situations in a new way and how you frame and reframe the questions and create paradigms or open yourself to new paradigms. It's about new ideas and imagination. And we're very good at that. But that's the kind of thinking that we need more and more in, in these rapidly changing times. I want to look at that further and the, the, the distinguish the types of thinking, but I want to go back to neophilia for a moment because – uh, you, you link in the, the neurotransmitter dopamine and a gene DRD4, which sort of um, attracts certain people to new, new novelty. Right. So there was one very interesting uh, event that happened just about 130,000 years ago that many scientists point to as the source of this uh, gene that we have for novelty. And that was uh, a climatic event that made it very hard for our species to survive. And uh, people say that our numbers dwindle depending on who you re read or believe to a few hundred or a few thousand individuals. And the ones that survived seemed to be the ones that were more exploratory and when, and when things went bad had, had greater resources at, at their, uh, at their um, fingertips because they had been exploring all along and just knew the, the environment better. And, and they were able to get away from the climactic change and to and to survive, uh, and, and then when, it, when things got better, to thrive. And at that point, uh, the, the records show that humans really started to spread a lot more. This is like a, a filtering where those uh, in our species who were less adventurous and exploratory died off, and those who were more uh, survived. And so from then on, we've been an exploratory species, and we spread to all corners of the earth, and really more than any other species, we, we occupy different habitats from frozen tundra to, you know, the rainforest, desert, dry, hot, everywhere on earth, we've, uh, humans have managed to survive. Mm -hmm. and, and that brings us to, to, to something uh, about this, the, the way we go about solving problems, because really a lot of this survival stuff, and even in the business world, has to do with solving problems. And normally we think of uh, our formulas for solving problems in an analytical mode, that top-down thinking that you mentioned earlier. Um, and then there are those who somehow um, go from the bottom up, and that's where the creative ideas come from. Right. So let's take a business. Take um, Encyclopedia Britannica. Okay. I, I like to use them as an example. They were they were in business for decades or 100 years, 
and, and they were the top encyclopedia company. And I use Wikipedia a lot, so this interests me. And then what happened is that when the Internet came, the idea what came to put uh, the encyclopedia online, which is that was not a, 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 it was revolutionary in a way, but it was not the big idea. The big idea that Britannica couldn't accept was that the authors of the articles would not be experts, that they that their employees would not be paid, that they would not sell this. No one would pay for this. You just pay whatever you want as a donation. These are the assumptions, the framework of thinking that was the old way of thinking that Britannica looked at and couldn't accept and, and couldn't didn't even give the you know the time of day to think maybe it'll work maybe we should try a foray uh, in, in that direction. Meanwhile, while they're while they're going the old way and using analytical thinking to optimize their business in the old approach, Wikipedia had the new approach and they just swept them away. And you can see that Netflix did that the blockbuster, and you can see that Kodak got you know who invented digital photos you know died because they couldn't keep up with the with the new ideas. So. This is about in, in any kind of business, or if you think about your personal life, in your in your personal life, if you follow along the framework that you have, you're limited. And if somebody comes to uh, in business to to challenge you, or uh, you know, in your personal life, you get certain challenges, and you're not able to break out of that way of thinking, uh, then you're not going to thrive. Now, the bottom up versus top down is directly relevant to that because. The kind of thinking that is the analytical, logical A to B to C is called top-down thinking. That's the kind of thinking that, say, uh, a company uses where the CEO tells everybody what to do or the architect tells the builders what to do uh, and, and or the programmer tells the computer what to do. That's top-down thinking. It's really where, where you have a framework of, of what you need done. You know how you're going to approach it, and you just logically create a plan and follow that plan. But the new ideas and the new assumptions and the revolutionary thinking that uh, Wikipedia and Netflix and, and Uber and all the other companies uh, that, that have, have you know, pushed aside the old companies that, that they exercise, that's bottom-up thinking. And bottom-up thinking in your brain is, come, happens in a much different way. Top-down thinking in your brain is thinking that's governed by certain what they call executive uh, functioning uh, portions of your brain that literally kind of orchestrate what happens, where your attention goes, and how you think to other structures in your brain. Uh, the bottom-up thinking is, is like little rebellions that come from the neurons, individual neurons themselves, and all the individual neurons are have their own little programs that aren't very intelligent on their own. But in bottom-up thinking, it, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts, and these little interactions of the little uh, micro neurons with each other somehow leads to off the wall from apparently from nowhere new associations and ideas that are that are, that can revolutionize your thinking. And the best way to understand it is to think of um, ant colonies because they work the same way. Um, an ant colony it acts like a uh, like an organism. It does very uh, sophisticated things as a colony. For example. Uh, a colony of ants on one leaf that uh, can build a bridge to go to to bridge the gap to another leaf, and some of the ants will 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 form the bridge, and others will crawl over them. Now that's really amazing if you think about it. There's no architect designing this, and there's no CEO telling them what to do. It's all these ants with their little individual programs that just tell them in any in very micro situations what to do when they encounter another ant or a chemical in the environment or this or that. And they have another. They have a simple response to a simple stimulus. But when you take the thousands of them together, and it adds up, the result are things like that, like the bridge. So that's bottom-up thinking that the colony is exercising. And the neurons in your brain are like the ants. That you're each doing very simple things, but sometimes they create new ideas. And that's what the, that's what um, innovation is all about. It's about how can you get those new ideas, which are constantly being formed in your brain but in the unconscious part of your brain how can you get them to your consciousness so that you can get the new idea and uh, revolutionize the world or your life or, yeah. or even yeah. not revolutionize but just plain adapt to what's new yeah I, I, I like the uh, analogy of the ant colony uh, until I found out that there are so many ants that they would outweigh all the humans if they were weighed, <laughs> comparing the weight of the two, and it takes a million ants for the mass of one human. That disturbed me a little. Uh, but, but let's <laughs> well, as a species, yeah. or as a class, yeah. <laughs> 
they are. Let's let's uh, talk about mindfulness a little bit as part of the way we access this, and also how emotion figures into getting into elastic thinking. Well, so your brain uh, is an idea generator, and through those, that bottom up processing, so on your unconscious mind, ideas and associations are are popping up and brewing all the time. Your mind, your, your unconscious mind, is a is a storm of new ideas. And if these all came to your consciousness, you, you'd be overwhelmed by them and you'd have trouble functioning. And some people do if, if, if uh, they have certain um, mental disorders. Um, but for most of us, we have these executive parts of our brain uh, filter out the ideas and only allow the most promising to get through to our consciousness. And the most promising often means the most conventional or ordinary. Now, that's good because it lets us function and it gives us promising ideas. And it keeps out silly, dumb, or off the wall, like random, unuseful ideas. But it, you know, in in that filtering process, it also keeps out original ideas uh, or very imaginative ideas that may initially seem odd and get filtered out. But really, when you think about it, are not odd. Like the Wikipedia idea that um, they're not going to pay the people who who write the articles, or that they're not going to vet the articles, and they're going to let the wisdom of crowds do that for them. So. Um, if, you know, people who have looser filters will get and consider these ideas that people with 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 um, filters that are more stringent, like at the Britannica people, won't won't allow. And one of the ways to become more innovative, to be like uh, you know the Einstein or the Miles Davis or the Mary Shelley, you know Frankenstein author, you know, to be someone who gets great new ideas, is to learn to relax those filters. And uh, there's various ways I talk about in the book that you can do that. And, and meditation is one of the ways that you do that. And uh, mindfulness meditation in particular is good because it allows you to understand your own thinking and your mindset. And, and, and before you change your mindset, it's useful to understand and, and, and know what your mindset is and how your brain is approaching problems so that you can take charge of it and, and approach problems in a, in a different, more elastic way. Mm-hmm. And you, you uh, linked uh, ADHD into this a little bit, too. That was an interesting point. Well, so the gene, uh, uh, the exploratory gene also has a, uh, an effect, uh, uh, plays a role in ADHD. And uh, ADHD is interesting in that it's, uh, it's a disorder of the brain's reward system. And uh, so whenever you accomplish something, you, you feel a little reward whenever you do something that feels good it's because you're you're stimulating your reward system and they people with ADHD have a little um, difficulty more difficulty in stimulating the reward system so they're always looking for new and and stimulating uh, experiences so they might flip from one you know from one to another but the thing about them is when they find something that does work for them that does stimulate them then they have the ability to really focus super focus and to do to, you know to continue that uh, because it's stimulating their their reward system, and uh, so psychologists have found that people with ADHD tend to have more uh, imaginative and original ideas, because the brain is searching for for new things to reward them. Um, so it's really a, a very interesting connection. Mm-hmm. And uh, the the whole idea of of uh, needing to relax the to to really access this was another uh, tool that I thought was important. Um, you you discussed the fact that, that uh, a lot of elastic thinking occurs better when you're tired, when you're exhausted, so that your executive system doesn't want to get in the way. Exactly. So when you're, you know, when you're that executive brain, when you're tired of uh, analyzing and thinking all day and, and, and you just need to chill, that you, you re, those filters relax and new ideas will pop into your mind that wouldn't have come when you're uh, when you're more energetic, that's why a lot of people notice that when they're laying in bed, for instance, they get ideas, um, or if you're jogging. And and so I'm talking the, in the book. I give, as I say, a lot of ways to to um, relax the filters, and those are some of the ways that you can do that so that you allow the the, the new ideas to come. And um, I also give a lot of uh, they call it questionnaires. They call them inventories uh, in the psychology world, so you can see where you stand on certain. Um, of the skills like mindfulness or neophilia, the love of the new. Uh, you can, you know, even though humans uh, are a neophilic 
species, uh, there are individual differences. And so you can look at the different um, characteristics of elastic thinking and see where you might need to want to nurture your, your thinking more, and then you can follow the exercises to do that. Yeah, and I I scored average on most of those, and so I, I <laughs> well, was I mean, a little... <laughs> So that's well. That means you're two thirds of the way to per to 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 beautiful, right? And and not only that, I mean, I, I score very high on some of them, and that, I can tell you that can get in the way of your life, which is why, uh, you know, when you look at some of the most creative people in the world, they also have sometimes personal issues because if your filters are, by nature, totally open, you end up doing odd and crazy things, and sometimes getting into drugs and other things. And and uh, it, so so if, if you're like you, uh, and you can open them at will and close them again. Maybe that's the best of both worlds. So, mm-hmm. so you don't go off the deep end. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I do, like did want to, uh, about people who are very, who are very imaginative and show how in their lives are not only very eccentric, but often, you know, have, have issues in their lives too, that are purely based on that way, way of thinking that if you're very creative and imaginative in your music, you're probably very creative in life. But if you're unrestrained, creativity in both areas can be and music can be amazing. You revolutionize things, and, but in our society, where there's certain constraints, uh, it, it may cause problems. Yeah, the case of, of Brian Wilson was 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 notable that the, that you uh, talked about in the book. Um, yeah, I, I did want to. That, that brings up. Go yeah, ahead. Go ahead. Well, you go ahead. Another issue, which is that, that you, one thing you, I talked about that you can also that you can use to relax the filters are drugs. Uh, mm-hmm. they, you know, alcohol, marijuana, both relax the filters in your brain in a certain way. Um, but they also do other things and that can be, a, you know, cause problems. In the case of Brian Wilson, uh, there are some connection between marijuana usage and schizophrenia in people who have a, um, a, a leaning toward that. And I think that's what happened with him. Mm-hmm. You looked at, at frozen thinking and I was really interested to see the, the ja- uh, Journal of the American Medical Association study that showed that the more experienced doctors were not as good at treating unusual illnesses as the less experienced because they were using their old framework and not considering other possibilities. But my favorite story about that is when your mother breaks out of it to buy a blender. <laughs> Can you recount <laughs> that for us? <laughs> yeah, well, my, my mother, who at the time, I forget, was 85 or something, uh, she... She didn't use the internet, and she needed a blender. And I said, "Well, let me just show you how this works." And and we got a blender for her, and it came in the mail, and uh, and it didn't work. <laughs> so she was like, "Oh, this is what the new stuff is all about." No thanks. I said, "Well, well, you know, it can get that can happen anywhere. We can just the nice thing is we can just return it, and we go online. But this website we got it from didn't have any easy return policy, and you had to pay to send it back, and it just wasn't worth it." So I just kind of said, gave up and, you know, go to Best Buy and get a blender. All right. So, but she, she had this motto, which is that she always used to tell me when I was a kid. And I think this is a good motto for life. It's where there's a will, there's a way. And it's like when you, when you're using your logical thinking and you come to a place where you, you, you seem like you can't push through it and solve the problem, rethink things, figure out another way, figure out a new approach. And that's exactly what elastic thinking is about. It's about that thinking that gives you the new approach. And her approach was, I thought, brilliant. She went to the Best Buy and bought the identical blender, um, came home, and the next day took the broken blender that, that, you know, uh, that, that she had gotten in the mail with the receipt, went back to Best Buy, and returned it. and said it was broken and got a refund. <laughs> so she had a uh, – uh, yeah, so she returned the broken blender, uh, exchanged it essentially at Best Buy rather than the place that sold it to her. And she was very happy with, with that. And, and, and I think she said that uh, – the one that she bought was a few bucks cheaper, so she made some money on it. But you know, I have to point out to her that the bus fares ate that up. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, great but story. Anyway, and uh, and that where, where there's a will, there's a way comes from her uh, uh, being a Holocaust survivor in part, doesn't it? Right, because um, you know she had a, 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 such a large number of almost daily life-threatening challenges and 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 uh, horrible situations and to overcome. And I think that. The, the, those who were in the in labor camps and concentration camps, uh, the ones who survived were the ones who really were the really good elastic creative thinkers who could find ways of, um, you know, getting out of horrible, unimaginably, you know, uh, horrible situations that, uh, that revol- involved a lot of cleverness and, and grit as well, you know, to, to, to keep going. But also, uh, and I tell some stories in the book, but there's amazing amounts of cleverness, just like she showed with the blender, 
but in those days it was to uh to, to, to just to survive but that you know that's what our species had to do also when we lived in the wild uh 300,000 years ago so that's you know both the um torturing of other humans and the uh, uh you know ability to uh be clever to get around it are are very human parts of us Mm-hmm. I, I was heartened to see how many ways we actually do access elastic thinking, and you mentioned marijuana and, and vodka and, and, and so on, but there, there's one section where you talk about um, uh, stressful, uh, stressed people versus people who are, have a lot more positive thinking going on. Let's talk about how that helps with elastic thinking. Well, of course, positive thinking, is positive uh, emotions are something we all strive for because they feel good, but in the realm of, of thinking, positive emotions are very useful because negative emotions tend to focus you on a certain direction. If you are, see a bear and you're scared, you're, you know, this fear focuses you on the bear. You forget that you're hungry. You forget that maybe you're trying to get to a certain place at a certain time. And you forget everything but the bear, and all your thinking is focused on getting away from the bear. Uh, a, a positive emotion has the opposite effect. It, it, it's unfocusing. It opens you up to the world, and that really broadens your thinking. And that's uh, important in elastic thinking is to is to defocus yourself and not when you're focused, your filters are keeping out everything but what's relevant. And when you're engaging in elastic thinking, they're open, and all sorts of wild things are coming into mind. And so, positive emotion and a, and, and being able to relax and feel good is uh, is an important element of elastic thinking. Mm-hmm. This is a this is a, a, a thought provoking book, and we haven't even touched on how how well you describe all the research about the brain that's been possible since MRIs and, and EEGs came into to, to being. And you really explain it in a way that even even someone who's not a neuroscientist can understand how the brain functions very well. Um, but the closing thought about uh, um, we're lucky to live in a time in which we begin to understand so much about how the mind works, I really liked. I, I, I know that your intention was to change the way we think about thinking and uh, how, how to become a more elastic thinker is, is evident in this book. Well, thank you, John. That, and that, that, that really was my goal. And I think that in, in today's you know, rapidly changing world, that's, that's really what we need. And, uh, and those who can do that and, uh, will, will thrive and survive. And those who can't, I'm, I'm afraid, are going to more and more be left behind. Mm-hmm. So you can reach Leonard at at L Maladno at L M L O D I N O W on Twitter or Instagram or my website Leonard Maladno L E O N A R D M L O D I N O W dot com. Great. Okay. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have. We've been talking with Leonard Maladno. The book is Elastic: Unlocking Your Brain's Ability to Embrace Change. I'm your host, Dr. John Cook. I thank you for listening. If you don't hear our regularly scheduled broadcast, I remind you that you can catch us on our YouTube channel, Good Books Radio, Strong and Cook. Make it a great day.